Okie doke. Okay, guys, sorry for, uh, like I said, a little bit of a slow start there, but uh, we've got uh, a few things to go through today. Um, I'm going to pick up with the material that we didn't quite get through last time, which includes, uh, no surprise, working on the projector again. Um, and then run through a few things that lead us really up to image reconstruction. We'll talk a lot about case space today uh, and try to link back to some of the spatial resolution uh, and spatial localization. Uh, lectures that you have with Kyung today. So today's a little a lecture that hopefully is going to tie together some concepts, uh, both uh, through the material of the slides, but also through working through some examples on the uh, board as well. Uh, so with that, get underway. So this is the process, of course, that we've been working on. Uh, and last time we got to the point of, of working with this uh, phase-sensitive detector here, we appreciated that uh, Faraday's law of induction would give us a voltage. We went through a bunch of steps to get there. Uh, and then we started working with this first phase sensitive detector and I said, oh, well, obviously if you can multiply by two cosine omega zero T, then you can multiply by two sine omega zero T. And it's that combination that's actually needed to give us the full uh, complex demodulated signal. It's this S of T signal here. And we're going to wrap up this uh, today and then we'll talk a little bit more about how we go from a time-based signal to a case-based based signal and how that ultimately allows us to basically put our data into an array, right? And we'll talk briefly about uh, some problems that we can have with putting our data into this array. Uh, ultimately, what we have to do is assign values, right, to every point in case space. We think we measured them because we were applying specific gradients at specific points in time, and we need to fill in that matrix. And uh, that's kind of where we're headed today. When we come back on, we've got a holiday coming up, right? So we'll come back in a week, uh, we'll pick up on uh, a little bit more of the details of actually reconstructing the case based data. So, we'll finally go back to this last set of steps here where we have K data. Uh, obviously, we've been saying it's just a 2D Fourier transform. We'll look more specifically uh, at, at why that works out the way it does. Um, so, then just briefly going over where we were from last time, this is the expression that we began to work with. This equation on the right hand side really came from the principles of reciprocity that told us that uh, the bulk magnetization would basically induce a B field in the local coil. We call this the receiver's B field. And it had a sensitivity, sort of a magnitude component, but it also has a phase component because it's a vector quantity that could be described as a complex vector quantity for a complex uh, value. And anyway, we went through a bunch of steps to take the, the derivative of this and look at all these individual dot product terms so we can simplify things a bit. Uh, and this is in part where we realize that the Z component of the magnetization, because it changes so slowly with time compared to X and Y, right? the X and Y components are whizzing around at warmer frequency, and the Z component's just really kind of slowly relaxing to something like T1. So we saw, maybe finally or hopefully, uh, that we don't really detect the Z component of our magnetization. Um, and so we were left with some slightly simpler expressions when we were done. We had an expression for the coil sensitivity. We looked at the individual components, recognizing only MX and MY uh, really count. And then we wrote things out in terms of free precession, where we knew there could be some phases from some other things, like uh, the RF phase itself, there could be a frequency term, Marmor frequency. And then, of course, the, the magnetization itself isn't stable. It's going to decay, but it has some additional condition. Uh, that, that, and that, that we start with at the time at which we're actually, say, recording the data. So a lot of trigonometry, a bunch of algebra, some uh, simplifications, and we finally ended up with this voltage signal uh, at the end here. And this was a, a good signal, and, and uh, hopefully at this point you can identify sort of the independent or individual terms inside of this voltage equation. And this is really just the result of Faraday's law of induction for the specific field components uh, that actually matter to us and the full magnetization components that matter to us. And the next step that we worked through was something like this, where we said, well, we've got this rather lengthy and kind of long voltage expression, uh, but we learned about phase sensitive detectors. And if we multiply by uh, a known carrier frequency, and this is done all the time in, in signal processing, when you know that there's a, a, a principal frequency of interest, in this case for us, it's the Larmor frequency. We're basically just multiplying by a function that looks like the Larmor frequency. And applying this low pass filter, if you remember, we had a really high frequency component term and then a, a substantially lower uh, frequency uh, term. And so a low pass filter, uh, applying a low pass filter mathematically, we just said, well, that high frequency component term just gets turned to zero 
filter it out uh, almost completely. Um, and because there's such a huge spectrum between our low frequency and really high frequency components, this is very effective. Uh, and we're left with just that low frequency term. And in doing so, that was the transformation finally in the sort of signal space, if you will, in going from the laboratory frame to the rotating frame. And that's important to us because we really think about the dynamics of the rotating frame. Uh, and then, of course, the image that we want to generate is a rotating frame. Um, again, multiplying by these different uh, 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 carrier functions or uh, baseband signals uh, could get us either uh, a voltage signal that was phase sensitive detection with a cosine or a voltage signal that was phase sensitive detected with a sine. And we didn't work through the latter one, but it's no surprise. There's just a sine term that shows up inside of here. There was some discussion after class about what were the leading terms here. Uh, we could talk about that more if we need to, but the assumption uh, that I don't think I pointed out carefully was that this term here really looks like, um, like an omega as a function of R, so there's a spatial variation, um, but uh, that's something like omega zero plus a delta omega, and the delta omega is pretty small. So uh, I guess in principle, this is really like an approximately equals, but it's, uh, it actually turns out to be a really good assumption too. Um, and so this is what we're left with trying to work out uh, for the, say, maybe the first 20 or 30 minutes of lecture today, is how we then combine uh, these two voltage signals, these two phase-sensitive voltage signals. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. We're just going to add them together, uh, treating one as the real component and the other as the imaginary component. Uh, and in doing so, in combining them in that way, we get a complex signal that tells us about uh, the state uh, of the transverse magnetization spectrum. Uh, and so we do finally end up with a vector-based quantity, uh, which is useful for us because, again, the magnitude and the phase principle are important things to us in MR. So we'll work through this uh, just now, basically. Uh, and what you'll see, not surprisingly, is that uh, this uh, S of T signal, this complex S of T signal, still depends on things like integrating over the whole object. It depends on the B receiver field again, uh, but we'll see that we make a, uh, use sort of a shorthand notation here to uh, make terms sort of line up a little bit better, depends on the transverse magnetization, and then we'll talk uh, a lot today about the spatial frequency encoding term, this dependence on uh, the, uh, the frequency generated by magnetic field gradients themselves. Um, and that's shown here, uh, and this gets at uh, at least one definition for k-space, where we can see that these frequency offsets, uh, they can vary as a, as a function of space and depend on time, so how long, for example, is the applied gradient turned on for. Uh, and the, the frequency offset will depend, of course, on gamma. It will depend on the gradient that's being applied dotted with space. So remember, gradients dotted with position or space give us field effects. So the units here work out to be frequency. Uh, and that's the same thing that we have here on the right-hand side. Uh, again, the spatial frequency means. Um, and finally, what we'll see today is we'll make this substitution where uh, it's this fundamental relationship here where we make a connection now between, say, k-space signals and time-based signals. And so with the substitution of this definition of k-space, if you will, we finally end up with the MR signal equation, which was, uh, I think, it, it came up for the first time at the end of Dr. Uh, Wu's lecture. And this ends up being probably one of the you know, more important expressions or equations in MR uh, because it tells us how uh, a point in k-space, so s of k, this is just telling you that you're at some point in k-space, uh, how uh, the value of the uh, case of k-space at that point or that position in k-space depends on your transverse magnetization at the time you're recording your data times some spatial frequency weighting term, spatial frequency encoding term. And we're going to spend a little bit of time both in MATLAB and on the board and so forth looking more carefully at this expression so we understand uh, maybe more intuitively what it actually means. So where we're really headed, uh, we, we, uh, if I'd stayed on track last time, we would have gotten to this point where we're headed in the next, say, 15 minutes is to get to this, uh, this part of the expression. We can finally uh, boil ourselves down to uh, the actual MRC equation. Okay, so the first step, well, let's see, questions about sort of where we're headed and how we got where we are so far? I'm not too, in this class, like when it comes to the final exam and things like that, I'm not, I'm not really concerned with these lengthy derivations. You're not going to see that in, in a final exam, for example. Uh, I do want you to understand the terms, right? It's really important you can look at any of these expressions and tell me in 
your own words, what these terms actually mean, uh, and maybe the assumptions that we have to make along the way, uh, lengthy derivations or not. <clears throat> I think uh, a good use of your time during the final. Okay, so uh, like I said, I said it three or four times already, we know how to do the cosine detected signal. Uh, I, I trust that you can very well do the sine detected signal. Let's talk about how we use both of these in so-called uh, quadrature detection to generate this complex value uh, S of T uh, function. Uh, you've seen this diagram several times. Uh, we start with that voltage signal. We work through this example. We'll skip working through this example. And we're simply going to combine these two signals now. We'll treat one as the real valued component of the signal. We'll treat the other as the sign valued uh, component or, or as the imaginary component of the signal. And the reason that makes sense or works is that uh, the signal itself, uh, the voltage signal itself, obviously has frequency information, but it also has phase information, meaning any of those frequencies could be offset some by a phase. Uh, and this is the A method for doing so-called phase sensitive detection. So combining uh, both of these to form a complex signal is, is a relatively straightforward way to get at both the magnitude and phase information of the underlying signal. Okay, so I gotta switch over. Um, so, uh, hopefully have your notes with you from last time. I'm not going to make too many jumps, but it might be useful to uh, at least partly refer to that. And our goal uh, now is just to form this complex valued uh, signal, S of T, and we form it from some real component as a function of time, plus some imaginary component. We just put imaginary I in front of it times S imaginary. And uh, this term on the left-hand side here, we get from the two cosine omega zero T detector. And the term here, we get from the two sine omega zero T detector. So we're literally just gonna add together those two components while also introducing uh, uh, the uh, complex notation. And so if we do that, we just end up with something like S of T. Um, we had an omega zero in front of all this and we were integrating over our whole object. So those look familiar from those um, phase sensitive detected signals. We still had our B uh, receiver fields uh, transverse component, which could vary as a function of space. And we were just talking about its magnitude. We had a phase term that shows up a little bit later in the equation. This is dotted with uh, the state of the transverse magnetization, which could vary over space, but we take it as constant at sort of the point in time when we start recording our data. And then if we look at what would happen if we uh, were careful to combine all of our uh, uh, remaining sort of phase terms, we'd end up with something like E to the minus I, uh, uh, all multiplied on delta omega, which is a function of R, times time, minus the phase from the RF pulse, uh, which could vary it over space plus the phase of the receiver, which could vary over space, uh, minus, remember we had that pi over two term, uh, just to keep, uh, at one point to move from a sine expression to a cosine expression. And so this is the expression that we get after we combine both the cosine uh, detected term and the sine detected term. And what's nice about this at least is that we collect a bunch of things in this complex exponential at this point. I suppose this probably all gets closed up with the differential position element too. Um, and as always, we're interested in trying to simplify things uh, at least a little bit. So uh, one thing that we can do is uh, we can, or I guess at this point already, uh, we did drop, we had a term that would look like e to the minus t over t2. Uh, it's not necessarily a good assumption. Uh, you might drop it if, for example, uh, the time scale that you're measuring on is a lot shorter than, say, T2. So there's not much T2 star 
uh, or T2 decay during the actual uh, acquisition event. That's not always a good assumption. Uh, and in fact, we'll, we'll re-examine that, that assumption later. Uh, but there would have been, say, a term up in here that would have represented a relaxation. I'm just going to drop it for now and actually come back to it. I forget if it's the next lecture or the one after that. Um, now I want to go back and, and uh, we had previously provided some definitions for uh, the transverse magnetization and the receiver's B field that were just uh, complex expressions for, uh, for those terms. And so you, you, you'll probably recall uh, that in general, we can write our MXY as a function of space and time as the product of some magnitude MXY and some phase. And for us, the, the phase of our transverse magnetization um, uh, as we've been talking about so far, is just coming from the RF phase for now. You could get phase from other things as well, but this is the only term we've been specifically carrying around. And then I'm going to define something, and I'll explain it in just a second, but we can talk about the complex conjugate of the B receiver field. And we denote that with a star, and I'll show you what that means in just a second. And we know that the B receiver field can also vary as a function of space. So it ends up looking very similar in terms of its uh, component form, if you will. It's still just the B receiver field's XY component, uh, which can vary over space. And that's dotted with uh, a phase term that comes from, uh, uh, from the receiver itself. So the receiver can color our signal with a phase. And you'll see that there's a difference in the sign of the phase that's used there. Uh, at some point, you have to design, define a, a coordinate system with which these refer to, and we did that much earlier in the class. Um, what's different now is I've introduced this idea of having the complex conjugate, and if you're not familiar with what the complex conjugate of a complex valued uh, vector is, we can just make a simple example on the side here. And so let's say that I have some vector here, uh, and this would be my real axis here, and this is my imaginary axis here. And the value of this vector here is just something like z equals x plus i y. That's just a general expression for a complex vector. I can have uh, the complex conjugate of that vector here, and we call that z star. And that's just equal to having the same real component minus uh, its imaginary component. And so we effectively just change the phase, whereas here, if you had, say, some phase then down here, you would have some minus phase. So it's just a handy way when we take the complex conjugate here, it's a handy way of collecting some phase terms in just a second. Mathematically, it's, it's sort of the same. Uh, so this is just a step again that's useful for collecting terms. So if we use these definitions now, we can write things out a little bit differently. And we can say that our S of t is just uh, the omega 0. I had an e to the minus uh, i minus pi over 2, so I'll pull that out in front because that's just a constant term. So there's some constant phase added to our signal. That doesn't matter too much. We care about phase differences, uh, say, between spins or families of spins. Still going to integrate over my object. Uh, and now I'll introduce the complex conjugate of my receiver phase, which can still vary as a function of space. I still have my bulk magnetization, but now I'm not writing it as the magnitude and phase term. I'm just saying I have some complex uh, magnetization that I can write out now. So these are now vector valued quantities, right? Whereas before we were writing a magnitude term and a phase term separately. Uh, and so we can collapse a bunch of those phase terms that show up here for the RF pulse and the receiver phase into these uh, uh, complete expressions, if you will, for the uh, B field and the transverse magnetization. And so what that means is the only thing we're, we're left with at that term of these four phase terms that were up here is the uh, spatial encoding term. And that just looks like E to the minus I delta omega, which is a function of space times time. And we'll close that up with our differential element. So this right here in the, in the very front, it's not too interesting. It's just a scaling term. And I said this uh, in the last lecture, but in MR, we don't really, sort of magnitudes themselves aren't really that meaningful to us because there's all these different sort of gain steps and, and sort of constant terms that show up in a bunch of different places. And 
people have worked very hard in trying to make MR sort of quantitative at that level, but it, it proves to still be very, very difficult. So oftentimes sort of overall scaling terms we don't care about. Uh, it came up very early in the lecture. We talked so much about contrast and MR, we care about contrast. But the contrast doesn't change if you double the value of everything, uh, not in the way that we care about, uh, especially if you're simultaneously doubling your noise, which would be the case if you just multiplied everything by two. Um, this term here, uh, the B, uh, the B uh, field from the receiver system itself or the coil itself, it's, it's definitely possible that this could be uh, uh, let's say not equal to some function of space, right? So by that I just mean you have such a good coil, uh, or a, or or a small field of view adjacent to that coil that in some you know volume of interest or region of interest the spatial variation is unimportant. Not a great assumption, not true of most imaging systems, uh, but if we want to simplify our lives, it's a it's a perhaps reasonable thing to do. And so what that leaves us with then, we can, we can go one more step here and we can say, well, the S of T that we maybe really care about now is really just the integral over the object uh, of, our, of the state of our transverse magnetization uh, times uh, our spatial frequency encoding term. And so here we have a, a couple things to point out, right? So this is obviously it's a complex valued signal, or hopefully that's obvious now, because we combine those two terms. And in being complex valued, we're able to detect both the magnitude and phase of our signal. If we didn't care about the phase, we could have just gotten by with the one cosine detector and, and left it at that. But uh, because it's just mathematically trivial, it's analytic to go the next step, uh, we certainly always do. Um, the MXY term, right, this term here, this is what carries our contrast. I always like talking about terms, right? So this is what carries the contrast information, image contrast information. And the transverse magnetization, hopefully you appreciate now, that can be made for the to have T2 contrast or T1 contrast or, you know, any other sort of form of contrast that depends on things like proton density, T1 and, and T2. Um, it also carries... Uh, this whole expression, rather, uh, carries the spatial encoding information. So as a function of time, and the time that we're talking about now is the time during which the uh, encoding gradients are turned on, right? Not the time of like the whole experiment, but now we're talking about this brief sampling event of a few milliseconds. During that period of time, uh, this signal is evolving, if you will. Um, let's see, that's my last quote. Right, and so then, uh, I, I basically said it already, but this, this, uh, this signal at an instant in time depends on how long this delta omega has been applied for. All right, so remember the connection back to uh, uh, back to the gradients is through delta omega. So the frequency offset that I have depends on the position that I'm at, uh, but it also depends on uh, on the magnitude and, and time history of the gradient that's actually applied. And we'll look at some examples today about how gradients effectively move us around through k-space. Uh, we're just a few steps away from uh, transforming this time-based signal into a case-based based signal, because that's the signal that we sort of ultimately care about, if you will, uh, just prior to signal transformation. Okay, so questions about sort of how we landed at uh, this expression here? A little less onerous than things we've done previously. So we know, or I hope now we understand how to form this complex valued signal. We just made some assumptions just to tighten it up. We could put back in any of those terms if we wanted to. And, and in fact, for real MR systems, we don't want to pretend that the, B, uh, the, the receiver's B field is spatially uniform. We don't want to forget about T2PK. Uh, we'll address some of these things over the next couple. 
So the next step, uh, like I said, is how do we go from a time-based signal to a case-based based signal? And the principal mapping between those two uh, spaces, if you will, is through the gradients. The gradients are what map, what map uh, us from a time-based signal into a case-based based signal. So we have to know what the applied gradients are. Uh, these kinds of definitions come just right out of the Lauterberg book. But what you'll notice, for example, this, this FV is supposed to be the frequency encoding gradient, for example. Uh, obviously, we know gamma bar is just gamma by 2 pi. And so, in general, uh, when we're turning on gradients, we usually turn on constant gradients. There's some interesting design questions we'll actually look today at a, at a non-constant gradient, but we usually talk about turning a gradient on and having it persist for some period of time. And so, in that sense, as time is progressing, our case space value is getting larger and larger, right? So if I've gone for a millisecond or I've gone for 10 milliseconds, that will directly impact uh, what case space vector I'm sampling at that point in time. And so we'll, we'll look at some examples to make these connections maybe even a little bit more clear. Uh, but the next step is to introduce how gradients map us from a time-based signal to a case space based signal. So we just go back to the board. <laughs> Okay, so you guys had this just a second ago, but I'll write it just to get us started again. So we have S of T is equal to, this is just the last expression that I wrote, the integral over the object. We always get signal from everything that we excited or everything that our coil can see that we excited. We have MXY, which is a function of space. Don't worry about time. Then we have E, the minus I, delta omega, which is a function of space times time. Close it up with dr, different shell. So the question is, uh, and we'll spend some time today talking about this, but what is delta omega as a function of r? You might have lost track at this point because it's been uh, a couple of lectures spread out over several pieces of paper on the board, uh, and it's good to sort of look at what that really is. So uh, what I would, one way I would answer that question, I would say in general, Uh, the object, the thing that we're actually trying to capture an image of, uh, is only going to see uh, a static, that's to say it's not uh, a function of time, temporally static, uh, but, it's, uh, but it is in homogeneous. We're going to talk about the field here. So it is a function of R uh, field during data acquisition. And remember that corresponds to free precession. And my only point is here is that usually during readout, the gradient that we care about, that this is G during readout. This is just turned on at some point in time, and it's constant for some period of time. That's a pretty typical readout gradient. Uh, again, we'll look at some examples as we go. So now we can talk about how our B fields connected to these gradient fields, something we uh, know a pretty good amount already. So how does the B field vary as a function of space? Well, the underlying B field is the B0 field. We always expect to have that around. Uh, but we also expect with the application of gradient that we'll have some spatial variation, some delta B uh, that varies as a function of space. So ideally, B0 is not a function of space, but we can, we can introduce spatial variations in the field. And we know how to do that. We just have our B0 field plus some gradient that we turn on, and then the spatial dependence comes in through where are you relative to the isocenter of the scanner. Uh, going back uh, a bunch of lectures, we of course remember that omega equals gamma b, uh, 
uh, we have a different B in this case here. So this is gamma times B0 plus the applied gradient dotted with the specific position. And so this really gives you an omega that varies as a function of space. All right, so we're pretty close to adding a delta omega because for delta omega, all we're talking about is uh, uh, separating out the B0 effect itself. And so then probably you remember this from before, but delta omega uh, is just gamma times G dot F R. So we were carrying around that delta omega term for a long, long time. Uh, what it's related to, of course, is the gradients themselves. Uh, so we can substitute that in. Uh, that's easy, easily done into our uh, complex signal equation. Uh, I'll just do it over here. Uh, so we have our S of T signal just from uh, the beginning of this sort of section integrated over the object. We have the state of our transverse magnetization. Uh, and then we have to have the spatial encoding term, which with this substitution here, just looks like e to the minus i gamma g dot r uh, times time. And so we just made a substitution. And so this is where we begin to see uh, that the gradients Uh, that they map a time signal to a k-space signal. Um, back when we were first uh, talking about k-space, uh, we had, and even in the slides I showed you just a little uh, bit ago, we had a connection then between k-space itself and uh, the gradient. So uh, helping us understand why this is true, uh, we'll make another substitution, big surprise, uh, remembering that the k-vector itself just depends on something like gamma by 2 pi times the gradient vector itself times time. The gradient vector can, of course, be a function of time, and then your k space becomes a function of time as well. So your gradient wave form, your g of t, gives you a k space wave form as well, dictating where you are in k space. Uh, and so, just by definition from that expression, uh, we have something like 2 pi times our k vector is equal to gamma times g vector times time. And we had a gamma times g vector times time up here. And so we can get uh, finally our mapping from this S of t based signal to this S of k based signal that we can write that our S of k based signal is just the integral over the object uh, times the state of our transverse magnetization. Uh, times e to the minus i 2 pi times our k vector uh, dotted with our position vector, our r vector, dr. And again, thinking of terms, we know this pretty well, but this first term here just tells us about image contrast. And the second term here is all about uh, spatial encoding. Uh, or I'll write it as spatial frequency mapping. And it's an interesting expression. It basically, what does it say? Well, this k vector that we have here is dictated by the applied gradients, right? The last substitution that we just made uh, uh, sort of explicitly wrote it out that the gradient vector that we have applied will define the k vector. And the, the, the stronger the gradients and the longer that it's applied for, uh, the bigger your k vector. And you'll see how, in just a second or, or later this afternoon, how these gradients move us around through k-space. Uh, the gradients themselves have history. We turn them on, we turn them off. They have positive signs, they have negative signs. And that will directly dictate where are we in k-space. Uh, and if you look at the units of this, you'll end up with units of something like spatial frequency. So 
uh, uh, cycles per distance, if you will. Um, and so uh, I, I guess another thing to recognize is that when we're talking about the, the, mag, the, the value, right, of our signal for a particular K point, the K vector in here just tells you where are you in K space, right? So if I draw out uh, a simple uh, space that represents K space, I have a point somewhere in K space, and that point in K space is just governed by a K vector. It has two components, so I'm somewhere in K space. The, the, the value, right? So now we want to talk about the value at that point in K space. Well, that's S of K. Or maybe we talk about just its magnitude because it's complex value. The value at that point in K space comes from the integration, of the magnetization from the whole object, right? Weighted by the specific spatial frequency that you're examining at some point in time. So when we talk about a point in K space, S of K, it's, it's summarizing for us how much of a particular spatial frequency do we have for the object or the contrast of the underlying object. And we'll look at a bunch of different examples. I want to look at this expression specifically using some MATLAB code. Uh, and then I think you already know how to change this term around by inversion pulses or sat pulses or gradient echoes or spin echoes or whatever. But this is the connection that I really want to focus on for, for a big chunk of today. What does a point in k-space actually mean? And I want you to remember that a point in k-space is getting information from the whole slice, right? Because our, 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 our coils are just picking up. They're just listening to whatever you excited. In general, you excited the whole slice. Uh, so you're getting all of that information, but you're filtering out a specific part of the information from the slice. And that filtering comes from the application of a specific spatial frequency. This lets you sample just one spatial frequency for a very brief period of time before moving on to its neighbor and its neighbor. And then filling in all of the K points to fill K space ultimately gives us a, uh, an estimate of the magnitude of all of these spatial frequencies. And that in turn, uh, through the 2D Fourier transform, recovers an image of the underlying object. Okay. So let's get back to our slides. Question? Yeah. So I get why spatial frequency is like so important, but I don't know how it plays into the image itself. Like, I don't know, I just can't make the connection. Yeah, it's really hard. So, uh, and, and uh, I think I probably said it one of the first days, but you know, this, this, what we're talking about right now, like hopefully you can look at the equation and say, okay, kind of get it. Mathematically, I appreciate what these terms are, right? What I want to do today is paint a picture of, of these terms. And then hopefully that partly answers or maybe entirely answers your question, but it's a very good question. This is the, the least, I think, intuitive part of MR. Uh, and it really was a, a total stroke of genius that Lauderer figured this out in advanced field. And it was totally predicated on actually CT work. That's a whole other story, right? But without the guys like Hounsfield working on CT, we wouldn't have gotten to this point either because those guys are working on radon transforms and Fourier transforms gave us the mathematical tools to deal with what are basically projection signals. Uh, so there's, there's really, it, it took some super geniuses to figure this out. Uh, but, but ask that question again in half an hour. Uh, and so we'll see where we stand. Based on this equation, could you explain why the center of the K space is always bright? Yeah, you can. Um, and so we, we could look specifically at this expression, right? So uh, at, that, at that point in time, you would have uh, your K vector would be the zero, zero vector, right? So this would just be E to the I minus zero. So it just looks something like one. And so now you have one times all of your transverse magnetization. Right, and so that's going to capture the biggest thing that you could possibly capture. If your object, um, we'll look at some examples of this too. But if your ob, well, let's we'll look at some examples too. But I hope I hope that gives you some traction. Please. Okay, let me switch back over here. These are great questions. Let's see where we land. Uh, so this is at least partly related. We've seen a slide like this before, I believe. But uh, in the middle of K space, uh, here I'll put the mouse here. In the middle of k-space here, we get these really large magnitudes because we're basically getting all of the magnetization detected in our coil. We haven't tried to 
filter it with any spatial frequency weighting. When we move out to other points in k-space, let's just move along this, this kx axis here. If we're at an intermediate point, then that this, k, this uh, spatial frequency term here, and we'll look at this mathematically in a second, is just uh, setting up a pattern of in the magnetization. So you have the contrast information coming in through mxy, but now you're multiplying it because you applied some gradients by some spatial frequency weighting. This spatial frequency weighting, say, in the, you know, sort of part way out into K space is lower spatial frequency. And as with the gradient is applied for longer and longer through time here uh, for the same amplitude gradient, then our K point is further and further out in, uh, along the KX axis. And that gives us a higher spatial frequency that we're sampling. You'll see in a second, but we're basically multiplying the state of our transverse magnetization by either this pattern or by this pattern and then sampling in that S of K, the, magnet, the resultant magnitude. So when our spatial frequency pattern is flat, meaning we're just getting the, the DC of our signal, we're getting the, the largest magnitudes that we would expect to get. And as we go out to higher and higher spatial frequencies, we typically have lower and lower amplitudes. Uh, if you look along the diagonal here, you can see something interesting now, because the k vector is complex value that can move out in the x or the y direction, the real imaginary direction. I can start sampling spatial frequencies along diagonals as well. And it's really the coherent sum of all of uh, these patterns that are the, the presence or absence of these patterns in my object that help me build up the image itself. Uh, so here's uh, a little bit of MATLAB code uh, of how we can sort of look at these functions because I think uh, it may not be obvious what this is, right? e to the minus i 2 pi k vector times position vector. The position vector just maps out points in the field of view that you care about, right? So we could take that as being isocenter plus or minus something along x and plus or minus something along y. And because we were slice selective, we don't worry about z, right? Just excited a single slice. The other thing we need to do is collect information for all of our different k points, and we'll talk about how those k points give rise to something. But this expression here, uh, if you evaluate it for all of your spatial positions and all of the k points you care about, will give you all of these different patterns, right? These patterns are all different k vectors mapped to the same set of position vectors, position vectors that span your field of view. So let's look at this with, with MATLAB. Uh, easy enough, we have to define some gamma. I'm going to go ahead and define uh, a gradient that I turned on to have an amplitude of 1 in Gauss per centimeter. Uh, I've got GY, uh, should also be Gauss per centimeter. And I'm just going to look at having applied that gradient for some, some, some duration. And in this case, it'll be a millisecond, right? Uh, so my units are seconds, so this is 1 times 10 to the minus third. I can define my KX and my KY. Where am I in K space? It's just uh, gamma bar times the gradient strength times the duration of the applied gradient. Uh, here, I'm just going to set up a bunch of positions. These are my R vector points, right? So defining some positions in space or across my field of view, and I'm just defining it from minus one centimeter to plus one centimeter along X and minus one centimeter to plus one centimeter along Y. Uh, this ND grid function here just gives me a grid of points that span my field of view. And now I just evaluate this function. I have uh, e to the minus uh, i times 2 pi times kx times x plus ky times y. And then I'm just going to display some different components of the resulting f function. So I can look at the real component of f, I can look at the imaginary component of f, I can look at the magnitude of f, and I can look at the angle of f. And you just get something like this. You can run this code. It's, uh, it's already uh, up for today's lecture. And so I end up getting different spatial frequency uh, sampling patterns. This is for a single K, right? So if you go back to this code here, why do I have a single K vector? Well, I fixed my gradients, I fixed my time, I calculated the components of my K vector, and then I just look at what this, this Fourier sampling function or this spatial encoding term actually looks like. And I just get these. So there are real and imaginary components of this, it's complex value. They look very, very similar. They're just different by a phase. If you look in the corner here versus the corner here, you'll see that there's a phase shift between those two patterns, if you will. If you look at its magnitude, it's not very interesting because we just have unit magnitude. So the magnitude of this thing is just flat. Uh, and then if you want to, you can look at the angle and that 
it just tells you sort of what's the angle of that complex signal. So let's just do this really quickly, uh, actually in MATLAB, and show you just some simple examples. So uh, is that, can you read that from the back of the room? It's just the same code we had a second ago, so hopefully it's illegible. Yeah, okay. Uh, so this is, a, this is actually probably the example I, I just uh, showed you, but we can just run through, we'll set up those examples, set up those examples, and we'll generate this figure. So this is the example that I had uh, in the figure. It's different than what I had in the code. So what's different uh, between these examples? Uh, if we look at what I had here, I had my GX as half, my GY as one. So I was off on some diagonal. If I want to, I could make my GY say zero. And I could run the same uh, thing again. What kind of pattern am I going to get if my GY, is, or if my GX rather is zero, my GY is one? How's my pattern going to be oriented? It's a little hard to describe. It's either going left, right, or going up, down, right? Depends how you hold your fingers, right? So now I have a KY, uh, if I did that, right? Yeah, so I have a very, hmm, doesn't look right, does it? Should go the other way, right? It's always good to show off your code in class. Uh, okay, so so I have a problem here somewhere. I won't try to debug it right here, but let's just look at the counter example where I turn off GX, uh, sorry, turn on GX and turn off GY, and I run it again, and no surprise, I get patterns going in the other direction, perpendicular. And then if I turn these on to be, say, equally weighted, I should run along a diagonal. And so now I have uh, a, a K point that's off on some 45 degree angle, if you will, from isocenter, and I get uh, such a pattern. And then the last example I'll show you is, well, what if I uh, say uh, double these? Now I just get a much finer spatial frequency pattern. So I'm just, you know, ideally your gradients are moving you through k-space to pick out different k-points, and those different k-points are helping you evaluate the presence or absence of this pattern in your underlying object. Okay? Yeah? What happens when the k values are negative and the the patterns not closer together, or do they go apart? Yeah, so we can look at, let's see if I can clear some of this up. Uh, okay, so it's, it can be a little hard to distinguish. So let's put this one up here. And so let's say I have that K pattern. And so it's a pretty high spatial frequency pattern. And then what do you want me to do with my coefficients? Negative one, negative two. Uh, okay, so this will be the negative twos. So it doesn't really look that different, right? And so those, they're, they're called conjugate pairs. You have two points in k-space. We went off, uh, from your perspective, we were positive, positive, and then we went negative, negative. And those are actually sampling very, very similar, basically the same spatial frequency information. They're negative frequencies it sees of each other. Uh, but that doesn't look all that different. Uh, what can be different between those two k-points, we'll talk about this when we get to artifacts, but the, the exact time at which you acquire uh, this point and the time at which you acquire this point are, of course, different. And so you can have errors in the measurement of this point that are different than the errors in the measurement at this point. So they're not precisely the same value because of system imperfections. Uh, and then probably you can anticipate if I, uh, maybe I don't need to do it, but I think you were asking about this. Is that right? And so then no surprise, you get a very similar looking pattern that's lower spatial frequency. Uh, okay, so let's get back to here. So this is the case-based signal, and this is you know really central to all of MR. It took quite a bit of work to sort of get to this point, right? We spent two and a half hours or three hours getting here. Uh, but hopefully you appreciate, uh, I've said it a million times at this point, that this is uh, sort of a snapshot of the underlying object. It's the state of the transverse magnetization when we're trying to record our data. And then what's really changing as a function of time is the K point that we're trying to acquire or the spatial frequency that we're applying to our object. This is a dynamic thing, right? I mean, that gradient is turned on. 
And that gradient's activity dictates where we are in K space at some point in time. With no gradients turned on, we're right at the middle of K space. As soon as we turn gradients on, we start moving away from the center of K space. So where we are in, in K space and the spatial frequency that we're sampling at that point in time depends on G, which might just be flat, might just be a rect function, but it could be something much more complicated. And then it depends on how long or how far into that gradient waveform you are. Uh, and taken all together, you have to remember that uh, we're assuming that the object doesn't really change with time. This is on the scale of milliseconds. We're assuming that we can, we can set up uh, a sampling pattern for a brief period of time. And while that's all happening, your spin system is still zipping around at 64 megahertz. So while you're visiting a point in K-space, you're actually fluxing past your coil you know, 10,000 times or something like that. And that's what allows you to get a voltage signal that you can actually record through this whole sort of pipeline. So at every point in K-space, you also have to remember that your spin system is wildly active, right? And zipping around very, very quickly. Uh, and that's why we can actually measure something at each of those K points. And so this is one way of interpreting this uh, K-space uh, signal equation. We know we have some underlying state of our magnetization, the underlying object. And we're literally, for, for the K point that we're acquiring, it's the multiplication of the state of the magnetization times the spatial frequency weighting pattern. That's going to integrate up into our coil. Our coil is the integrator, right? Our coil just listens, right? It hears everything. And so it integrates all of that information to give you the, an estimate of the magnitude of a particular k-point. Uh, magnitude and phase, it turns out, of a particular k-point. But graphically, this is one way of interpreting that uh, uh, the k-space signal equation. Now, obviously, we have to sample a bunch of different k-points. We don't care about just this spatial frequency pattern. We have to move around k-space sufficiently to capture all of the spatial frequencies that we care about. We can debate which ones we care about, but suffice it to say, it has to be sufficient to help us reconstruct a, a useful picture at the end of the day. Okay, so this actually relates back to Kanov's question uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. Let's say that our underlying object is this. Our underlying object is some thing that has a sinusoidal uh, pattern in it. And at a particular point in time, we're sampling this particular spatial frequency, right? So we're basically asking does our underlying object have a lot of this spatial frequency? So will the S of K point we measure at that point in time, will it be big or small? Big, right? Whatever big means. It's bigger than lots of things and maybe smaller than something that's huge. Uh, but it's going to be big, right? Because our underlying object itself looks a lot like the spatial frequency pattern. So I expect that when I multiply those two things together and add it all up, integrate it, I should get a pretty substantial value. What about this case? What if my underlying object is, you know, some high frequency banding pattern, and I'm basically multiplying it through with the application of my gradients with a lower spatial frequency banding pattern? What's the product of these two things, high or low? What's that? Low, right? There's not much over, there's not much frequency. There should be no or very little frequency overlap between these two um, fields, if you will. So you expect to get a low uh, sample uh, or a low estimated value. And then more to Kanov's point is, well, what kind of mag what kind of value do you get if your object is, is really flat in contrast? Uh, here, uh, for this particular spatial frequency, you may get some you know, relatively intermediate value, right? If you have a completely flat signal uh, uh, and there's some noise in there, then your case, then your K point representing this particular pattern is going to be relatively intermediate. Okay. So uh, here's, I think, another update of sort of where we are, right? We know a fair bit about RF excitation to generate transverse magnetization and how that transverse magnetization produces a voltage in some nearby coil. We went through a whole bunch of steps, phase sensitive detection and low pass filtering, and then added those signals, those two complex signals together uh, to give us this. Uh, complex signal and then substituted in k-space. And what that ultimately actually gives us, uh, uh, this should be, uh, it's a little bit inaccurate, but it gives us our S of k signal, which is related to our echo, the, the, the data that we actually put into k-space. When we have those, uh, well, okay, so let me back up. 
we have to do this to uh, acquire a sufficient number of echoes. An echo is a series of K points, right? And, but we need all of the K points to represent the entire image. And so typically we have to re repeat acquiring the echo for all of the different phase encoding steps. So if our image, we'll look at some examples, but if our image is, you know, 128 pixels wide and it's 96 pixels top to bottom, that 96 is usually going to be the phase encoding direction because it's lower in, in number. Uh, we're going to have to repeat this process here, say 96 times. And that's one reason uh, that MR can be relatively slow. When I have my echo data here, it ultimately helps me fill one line of k-space, right? And that's why this repeating of the echo acquisition is necessary, but I have to repeat it with one small difference, and that's that I have to update my phase encode gradient each time. And every phase encoding gradient is a little bit different through the sequence of uh, image acquisition events, such that I can map out acquiring all of these different lines of k-space. We'll talk about this uh, today as well. But the idea is that after all of that processing, you know what your S of k's are, you know what gradients you are applying, so you know what k value you are measuring, and you know where to put that measured signal in k-space. So we can take our S of k signal and put it somewhere in k-space. And if we've done all of that correctly, then again, finally, a FOIA transform helps us recover the image of our underlying object. So there is an assumption, a lot of assumptions, right? This is far from the only assumption. What I just showed you was that we said, well, we know what gradients we applied, and through the application of those gradients, we moved through k-space so that we could fill a line of k-space. But we actually were assuming that when we applied those gradients, that the system responded by uh, by exerting those exact fields, right? Our gradients aren't perfect, right? So what's going to happen when, you know, we sit down and, and with a computer, we design very, very carefully the timing of our exact gradient waveforms. We know to the microsecond and to the micro gauss what gradients are going to be uh, applied. Uh, what happens if the system doesn't respond with playing exactly what we coded? Of course, that's going to be true because the systems are imperfect. So the question is, I, have, I've, I will have measured a bunch of S of K data, right? And I think I know what gradients were applied because I told it what to apply. But where is my K data really live if my gradients weren't perfect? It's not obvious. But I'm going to end up somewhere else, right? So I was trying to fill in this line here of K space, but my gradients didn't really quite listen to me. And that means that I moved through K space in a way that I can't actually know, but I moved through a way, I moved through K space in a way that was different than what I actually wanted. And so the real K data may belong along this white line. That's the fields that were actually applied. That's the K points that were actually being sampled. But I didn't know any better. All I know is what I programmed the computer to do. And so I'm effectively forcing my measured K data to fill this gray line, when in fact it actually belongs someplace else. And that basically, you know, surprise leads to image artifacts. So when our gradients don't do exactly what we want, what we want them to, we, don't, we know less precisely what K points we acquired. And as a consequence, our K points will be not assigned to their correct K space position. And you'll end up with any diff, you know, a number of different kinds of artifacts, usually relatively subtle for the specific thing I'm talking about. But the point is that gradient imperfections will bring you through a different part of case space than was your target. Um, when it comes to actually acquiring case space, there's a lot of different options. I think uh, uh, this might have been touched on by Kyung, I forget. Uh, and this is just to sort of point out that there are different ways that we can move through case space. And most of what we talk about is Cartesian imaging. 95, 99% of MR imaging is Cartesian acquisitions, meaning we just move rectilinearly through k-space. I should have labeled this as like kx and ky. Uh, but we can do other things. We can uh, design gradients so that we have so-called radial acquisitions, and we just have to reconstruct the data a little bit differently. We can do so-called spiral acquisitions, and we can do so-called circular acquisitions. They each have their sort of pluses and minuses. Uh, there's good reasons and bad reasons why you might want to try these things. Uh, it turns out Cartesian is basically the most robust partly for the reason I was just describing. If our gradient system is a little bit imperfect, it may mean that all of our uh, acquired K points are just shifted down a little bit. And a shift in Fourier space doesn't really affect our magnitude images very much at all. 
uh, a linear shift in J space doesn't affect things very much. If, on the other hand, uh, it's no longer a linear shift because you're on a spiral or a radial trajectory, those imperfections can compound in some sense and give you worse image artifacts. So the point I guess I would make is that for these non-Cartesian strategies, gradient imperfections matter even more, and corrections of those imperfections matter even more. So everyone working in these sorts of uh, fields is very sort of aware of their uh, gradient system performance, and the Cartesian guys are, are busy doing other things. Okay, so uh, I won't go to this for too long. Uh, the only one we really care about for this class is that Cartesian case-based data can be reconstructed just with a simple Fourier transform. We'll talk about that more in the next lecture. There are all a, lots of different ways of reconstructing these radial and circular trajectories and the spiral trajectories and so forth. They mostly result in something like regrading to polar coordinates and using a radon transform or regrading those points to Cartesian coordinates and using a Fourier transform. So you can imagine those points that you actually acquire just are arbitrary points in case space. You need to figure out a way mathematically to deal with that. Not a topic we'll cover in this class in any detail, but if you take uh, 229 next quarter, uh, don't get into that uh, more so. Okay, so I want to talk about how we uh, move around in case space. Let me do a quick check of where we are versus where I want to get to that. Um, why don't we take a quick five minute break, uh, it's just about the hour, and then uh, I'll get myself set up for, actually no, let me do two slides and then I'll get set up for the stuff on the board, uh, and then uh, we'll take a quick break. Well, I'm okay, so the question now is uh, give you some more in insight into uh, how we actually, what I call move around case space, how do we do that? So here's a more formal uh, description, more formal connection between the gradient waveform, and by waveform I just mean gradients varying as a function of time. Uh, some of the expressions we used just you know, a little bit ago, we said, ah, it's a constant gradient, and so the integration of something like a box function is kind of boring, it's just gradient times time. Uh, more generally, uh, you have gradient waveforms that that's, you know, move you around Cartesian case space or spiral case space or radial case space, whatever uh, you're trying to accomplish. Um, at the beginning, uh, the question is, uh, where are we at time equals zero? Well, at time equals zero, the K point that we're at, we haven't done anything with our gradient. And so uh, in terms of where we are in K space as a function of time, we haven't gone anywhere yet. Uh, the gradient hasn't been turned on, so we haven't gone anywhere. If our gradient waveform is a, is a box function like this, then after some period of time having turned on that gradient waveform, we have to integrate the area under the gradient waveform. That's all this expression is, multiplied by some constants, and we will have moved out to some other point in k-space. And so where are we in k-space as a function of time? Well, we're linearly increasing in k-space. Where are we actually in k-space? We're just moving along, in this case, a single direction. We just have a, a single gradient turned on. Maybe it's an x-gradient. Uh, and as I move, as that gradient is on for longer and longer and longer, then obviously I move out to further and further points in k-space, so my k-value is getting higher and higher as a function. So the longer that gradient is turned on, the more and the farther and farther I move out into k-space. What does that mean? Well, it just means that that gradient has been on long enough to wind up the spins to a higher and higher spatial frequency. If you start off at the zero at, at, at the zero point of k-space, you haven't wound up the spins yet. As soon as you turn on a gradient, they start precessing at different, at different speeds because of their position relative to isocenter, and you start generating one of these patterns. And it's going to be initially, it's probably a little bit obvious now, initially it's going to be a low spatial frequency pattern. And the longer that gradient is on, the more phase you wind up, uh, the higher and higher uh, the spatial frequency pattern itself. And so you're necessarily further and further out in k-space. Uh, so the example that we'll look at in just a second is related to what's uh, shown here. This might help you uh, not have to write down everything that I'm going to write down. Uh, and the expression to keep in mind is that where we are in k-space, or the magnitude of our k-space uh, as a function of time, depends on uh, our gradient waveform history, or the integral of our gradient waveform. So when we come back in a second, we'll look uh, at some different examples about how we move around in case space. Okay? All right, let's take a couple minute break. Uh, I'll get set up and then uh, we'll move to the next thing.
All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I always have a lot that I want to share with you guys. I always have a lot of material, too much material. I'm going to have a caffeinated enough. All right, Jin Joan, you go. Here we go, guys. All together now. Okay, uh, I had two examples sort of set up. I'm actually just going to show you one because the first one's it's pretty easy and, and it's less interesting than this one. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about a, a general example where uh, we, we don't just have you know you know sort of square or box like gradient functions, but we have something a little bit interesting. And in which case, it could actually be relatively arbitrary, but we'll define something. So let's just say we've got. Uh, uh, for some reason, we've been told by your advisor that I want to figure out what these gradients do. Uh, okay, fine. So let's say that our g of x gradient, we're going to use two gradients simultaneously. And we're talking about the question we're answering for ourselves is where are we in k space? How are we moving around in k space? And let's say that uh, the gradient that we're applying has some magnitude, and it's governed by a cosine uh, times 2 pi t divided by tau ac. And I'll draw these things out in just a second, but tau ac here is just how long is the acquisition interval persisting for? How long are we bothering to sort of pay attention? Uh, so that gives us a g of t that we care about, but it's not the only one we care about. Let's say we care about a g of y uh, of t also. And that's uh, perhaps not surprisingly, I'm gonna use a sine term. And so I'll have g times sine of the same thing. So 2 pi t over tau acquisition. And so these are just sinusoidally, cosinusoidally varying uh, things that have a frequency that's something like t over t acquisition, or tau acquisition, rather. So let's just, uh, just to be careful, uh, let's draw what these uh, waveforms actually look like. So this would be as a function of time. Uh, I'll draw my g x gradient first. It has a maximum amplitude that could be g, uh, and it has a minimum amplitude that could be minus g. And in this case, it's cosine. So at the beginning of some uh, uh, interval, uh, at time 0, it has a value that's equal to uh, my gradient amplitude g. And then uh, I'll pick an endpoint that's going to be down here. I'm setting myself up so I can actually draw a cosine wave for you guys. Uh, 
And I know after a period, it's going to end up back up there, uh, say, and then somewhere in the middle, it has to hit uh, minus g because it's a cosine function. So with three points, I kind of know how to draw a cosine. It looks something like this. Uh, and then if it's not clear already, the starting and ending points here define the time t back. Okay, so that's the gradient that I'm imagining turning on. Uh, or at least the x gradient. The other one I have to care about is my y gradient. So let's draw that out as well. Uh, it also can have a minimum amplitude of minus g, and a maximum uh, positive amplitude, I guess, of g. Uh, this one's a little bit easier because it's sine wave, but better at drawing that. So it looks something like that, and it persists, it's turned on and off for the same amount of time, of course, as the other gradient. Okay, so those are the gradient waveforms that we're talking about. And the question, at hand, uh, the question that we're trying to answer for ourselves is where are we in case space? If I turn on these gradients, uh, these gradients are functions of time. I mean, the different points in case space is a function of time. Where, where am I? What's going on? Uh, so then we just need to remember, uh, you have this in your notes already, the definition of case space as it relates to the gradients itself uh, is just equal to something like gamma by 2 pi, the integral of the gradients. So it depends on the gradient history, if you will. So we've got two different gradient functions. We just need to plug those in, integrate on them. We'll get functions that tell us where we are in case space as a function of time. And then we can map that out into sort of case space. OK, so uh, plugging each of those in and carrying out the integration, I would get something like, uh, say, kx of t is just equal to gamma by 2 pi the integral. Uh, here I want to uh, use the, the general form, so I'll have uh, integrating from 0 to t. Uh, my specific gradient waveform is just g times cosine of 2 pi, say, tau pi tau acquisition d tau. Uh, and I'm just integrating a cosine term here. I need to carry out some constants from inside my cosine here, so everything actually works out. And I have something like T acquisition times gamma, if I did this right, d pi squared times my gradient strength times sine of the thing that I had here all along. And so this here, uh, is what really sort of steers me through k space. How long has that gradient been applied for? How much long, uh, how much time has passed uh, uh, from the beginning of that gradient having been turned on? It's okay. Okay. So we just do the same thing again. I have a ky uh, component that I want to figure out. Together, these will give me my k vector. Right? I have my x component, my y component. Uh, this is uh, similarly similarly found from gamma by 2 pi times the integral from 0 to t of g of sine uh, times 2 pi tau over tau position tau. Uh, it's a little bit, a uh, tiny bit more involved here, but you just end up with the same leading coefficients or leading terms, t act times gamma over 2 pi uh, squared. And then we should have times the gradient amplitude that we're talking about. Uh, and it looks like 1 minus cosine of 2 pi t over t acquisition. And close it up. And so what's happening inside, say, this term here, uh, I guess the one way to think about it, you can think in terms of the frequency, you can think in terms of the period. But we're going to go through one um, period in time uh, t equal to tau. That's sort of how we set it up, right? So easy enough. We know where we we know what our k uh, kx uh, component is as a function of time. We know what our ky is as a function of time. 
we're just uh, now trying to figure out where are we in k-space uh, so we could draw out our vectors, uh, sorry, our axes for k-space. And we have, say, kx, and we have ky. And so what, uh, what are these expressions for time equals to zero? Where are we? What's our kx when time equals zero? Okay, so we're just going to be, we know we're going to be at the zero axis for kx. And what about when time equals zero for ky? Zero. So I'm going to start off at my origin. That looks good. Right? Yeah. What's that delta? Is that Oh, yeah, it's my own font. Sorry about that. One period. O N E. If I if I use I have three forms of handwriting. I have this one, which is kind of weird looking, but I call it it's my own font. And then I have when I try to write normally and you won't be able to read it at all. And then if I use cursive, then it's a total disaster. So this is as good as it gets, right? So I sorry for that. Uh, it's not good enough. I could give an example of all my different handwriting styles later. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start off at zero, zero, fine, and then I won't you know, sort of go through every detail here, but what this is going to map out, perhaps not surprisingly, is a circle through k-space. And so we'll end up with a trajectory that looks like this. And in part to save time, and in part because I didn't put it in my notes, uh, you could work out sort of the limits of where we are in k-space. But this is, um, I think, sort of gives you some insight, at least, as, again, the connection between the applied gradients and where we are in k-space. The gradients move us through k-space. I had an easy example. I'll show it to you for, except for, for a second, uh, only because I, it'll take a fair bit of time to actually go through it. Um, uh, this is a, a more simple Cartesian example. It'll, it'll be in the recorded lecture, so you can follow it there as well. But in this case here, I was saying, well, let's say I moved out by, uh, I moved out with a gradient uh, for, that had a total area of A, and we know that areas matter when it comes to k-space because we're just integrating the gradient as a function of time. And so the combination of turning on, say, this gx gradient and this gy gradient, we're going to move minus along kx and plus along ky, and that's what's going to bring us out from our origin up to some corner point here, for example. The next event here is simply just a gradient that persists with an area of 2a only along the x-axis, right? So now I've moved up to this point in kx, ky space, and I'm going to move straight across the kx axis for a constant ky. And if you follow through each of these sort of many gradient waveforms here, you're going to go from the origin up to the corner, and then you're going to move along k space in straight lines. This is basically a phase encoding gradient that moves me down to another line of k space, and I raster across and I collect that line. And then I play another phase encoding gradient to move down further. And I zip across, and then down, across, down, across. And then finally, at the very end, if you look at A and A, I'll come back to zero. Okay. So for the gradient waveforms that I've drawn here, and for the k-space trajectory uh, that I have right now, uh, what, is, what is the integral of my gradient waveforms for these particular gradient waveforms? I heard someone say it, zero. Right, so these gradient waveforms were designed so I came back to zero. We sort of saw it graphically or sort of together. I won't work through every sort of step here. You can look at it sort of online if you need to. But uh, these kinds of questions uh, are frequently on the final. So being able to understand the connection between k-space and the gradients. If I give you a k-space diagram, can you draw the gradients? If I give you the gradient waveforms, can you draw the k-space? Where we are in, in k-space or where we are in some gradient waveform. That's a good connection to, to, uh, to follow through on. Yep. Yeah, I know gamma is commonly reported like in two different ways, one without it in terms of radiance, and one with it, with it being in terms of radiance. Yeah. Is this gamma with radiance or without radiance? Uh, yeah, so gamma bar would be gamma by 2 pi. And I always use gamma, or intend to use gamma. And so, again, so it's a it can be a little bit annoying because when we talk about signals, we usually talk about frequencies. The frequencies are in cycles. The cycles aren't radians and they're not degrees. So you usually have three units for angular measure, right? 
and it, it will snag someone at some point on the homework or on the final or something. Uh, not because we try to be crazy about it, but you have to you have to be right. Uh, and it's always a little bit of a nuisance, coupled with Gauss and Tesla not being a factor of a thousand. It's also a little bit painful sometimes. Okay. Yeah. So just kind of in steps, essentially we apply like our RF pulse and then our slice select gradient, and then we do the fr phase gradient, yeah. and then we do the, um, the the frequency. Yeah. And that captures one row of case space. Yep. And then we go back to yep. another one, and then that captures another row of case space. So between the different echoes that we're capturing, um, we're using the same frequency encoding uh, gradient, but we're varying the phase encoding. Got it. And then how are we varying the phase encoding? Is it the time or the amplitude? Of what it's, such a, it's such a great question. Uh, it's very insightful. So if, if you go back here, um, what I was showing to keep it simple is I was saying, I was talking just about areas, right? So what's the area of my gradient? Why do I care about areas? Well, I said I care about areas because K space is related basically to the area of the applied gradient, right? So when we talk about the phase encoding gradient, all that matters, and you can see these are all just phase encoding gradients, right? They're just stepping me through different lines of K space. All that matters is their area. There's different ways to achieve the same gradient area, right? I could, uh, I could equivalently have a gradient that was half as long and twice as tall, or I could have a gradient that was twice as long and half as tall, the areas would be the same. When it comes to actually designing sequences, which, which requires the most gradient area, getting to this line of case space or getting this line of case space? Or maybe it's easier to compare. Do I need more gradient area to get to this line or more gradient area to get to this line? A or B? B, right? I need more gradient. I need more gradient area. The gradient has to be stronger or on for longer to get out to this line here. So usually you design your sequence for the, for the, K, uh, the K line that's farthest out because that requires the most area. And because of hardware limits or something else, that'll, that'll dictate how long it takes to apply that gradient there. So what that means is, um, uh, if, I, if I drew it out, and this will, this will come up in the slides in just a second, but I could have um, a gradient that looked like this as one of my phase encoding gradients, and that might get me pretty far out in case space, but maybe I need to go twice as far out in case space, and so I need to use this gradient, right? I could have, for this first gradient, the black one underneath, I could have done this as well. I could have gone up for half as twice, just as high for not as long. Usually, it's this it's this red gradient here that sort of limits the overall timing of the sequence. And so we'll design the whole series of gradient waveforms for our maximum k line, and then we'll just scale this down by its area by half or a quarter or a third or a sixteenth or whatever to get the phase of gradient reaction. And that keeps the timing the same. We don't like to have variations in our timing within a sequence usually. It would change, for example, your echo time from TR to TR, and that's not usually a good thing. Yep. Yeah, how much gradient has to be applied while we compare the lines? You're talking about net gradients that be applied to a positive and to a negative net Yep. And so we saw that in this example here, I know I know I went through it quickly, but this first, these first two gradients here, they move us out to this, this point in K space that's here. I actually get all the way back down to the zero point when I'm partway through one of these other REOC gradients. And that's the point at which the integral of the gradient waveform is zero for KX and zero for KY. And then I actually move away from that again with the second half of these gradients. And it's only because I turned on these two gradients at the very end that I actually brought myself back. Depending on what you're doing, you might not bring yourself back. That might not be useful. You might crush your signal, destroy it with a gradient, and just go do something else. But uh, in this example, I brought us back to zero. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, take a look at the slides because, as usual, we're gonna not get to everything. <laughs>
I think I can I can probably get through most of this action. So let's just go through it in sequential order. Okay, so uh, yeah, please. For that example you were showing us, um, usually are you given which one is your frequency gradients and which one is your phase? Yep. Okay. Yep. It's okay? Okay. So I just want to give some more sort of you know, inside in case space is one of the most challenging sort of concepts to understand, both how we sort of create it, generate it, and then what it even really means. So these are just some simple examples to help us understand better what it means. So case space, hopefully you understand now, is effectively the raw data collected by the scanner. For you guys, I should put raw in quotes, because you know now it's a voltage signal, and then you have to do a whole slew of things to it before you actually get to case space. The real raw data is the voltage signal. On the scanners, the scanners handle all that uniformly the same every time because those steps procedurally don't change. So we usually talk about the raw data as being the K data. And so, you know, if you're working on a research project, you oftentimes need to get the raw data from the scanner so you can, you know, perform on that data the things that you want to to improve your image reconstruction, for example, instead of relying on what the manufacturer does. A single point in K-space, I like saying it this way, tells us about the presence or absence of a spatial frequency or a pattern in the acquired image. So when we talk about things being bright in the middle of K-space and not as bright out at the edges, it's telling us about the magnitude of that spatial frequency pattern. We have a lot of it in our object, or we don't have very much of it in our object. And a little bit magically, this is all thanks to Foyer, the, the right combination of all those spatial frequencies actually is representative uh, analytically of the underlying object itself. Every echo, spin echo or gradient echo, helps us measure many of the spatial frequencies, right? We're getting a line of data across the middle of K-space, or generally through the middle of K-space. Uh, and it's, it part helps us comprise some of the information we need uh, to recover the object. K-space has units, I like keeping track of units, uh, and it's either gonna be in inverse centimeters or inverse millimeters. And this is why we call it spatial frequency. Uh, if we talk about temporal frequencies, which is what most people think of when they talk about frequencies, it's just one over time. And here we're just talking about one over space. So how many periods are there for the field of view? Is it high spatial frequency or low spatial frequency? Uh, and of course, the gradients are what help us extract the spatial frequency information and move us around K-space. Uh, and importantly, a single line of K-space is filled by an echo. Uh, there are some nuances to this, but certainly for uh, first pass and for this class, it's a good uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, this, I hope uh, you've either seen before or, or, or sort of know well already. The white box here is just intended to represent some signal, but it could be a, a function of time or it could be a function of space. It's just some boxy function that's positive and a negative and a positive. And what Fouet taught us is that we can decompose this into a sum of sines and cosines of the appropriate amplitude. So at first swipe, this sine wave, not such a bad match to that underlying signal. And it has some amplitude that will be the best match to that underlying signal. And as we add more and more spatial frequencies, we can get a closer and closer approximation to the underlying object. So here I'm showing you four different spatial frequencies or temporal frequencies, doesn't really matter. And if I add all of those up, they all have their own you know, unique amplitude, if you will. If I add all of those, literally just add those signals together, what I recover is the white dashed line. And the white dashed line is, you know, it's a better match to that boxy function uh, than the original sine wave was, uh, but it's still not perfect. Therefore, I need more and more spatial frequencies to get me closer and closer to recovering the, the true underlying signal, if you will. Now, when we look at maps of K-space, what we usually look at is magnitude K-space. And in looking at magnitude case space, we're just talking about what's the amplitude of this frequency in our underlying object. What's the amplitude of this frequency in our underlying object? Uh, so you should start making that sort of connection between points in case space and spatial frequency patterns and their presence or absence. Um, if I take the Fourier transform of each of those underlying signals, the, each, the Fourier transform tells me basically about the magnitude of those different uh, frequency components. So I have a larger magnitude for this low frequency stuff, the red signal, and I have a relatively, uh, sorry, I have a high magnitude for this low frequency stuff, and I have a relatively low magnitude for this lower frequency stuff. This is a stick plot. It's common when you're dealing with one dimensional signals, uh, but it's not very useful when you want to go to two dimensions. And so in two dimensions, uh, we typically map amplitudes to some color. Uh, you've seen me using this color map that MATLAB has called the hot color map. Uh, and high amplitude things end up being really, really bright. And then you go through these sort of 
different colors from yellow to red, kind of dark orange, so that lower amplitude things end up being effectively darker. So now when we look at actual case space here, this is the 2D acquired case space, and a 2D Fourier transform recovers this as our underlying object. This 2D case space here at every point, this is, I forget, you know, 128 by 128 points or something like that. And every point tells me about the presence or absence of a particular spatial frequency. Uh, and you can see that, you know, in some ways it's, it's really remarkable, right? This is the, you know, an image of the beating heart. There's 30 frames, you know, captured during a cardiac cycle. And there's a lot of, you know, arguably interesting information and dynamics in this underlying image. There's a lot of information, if you will. Well, all that information is comprised of a bunch of different spatial frequencies, which you see on the left-hand side over here. So I have to have all of these spatial frequencies, and they arguably don't really change nearly as much or nearly as interestingly as the actual image itself does. But this is the same information content, if you will. Can I? So does that mean the K space would be different for each frame? Yeah. And so if you look carefully here, I've got 30 magnitude K space images, and I've got 30 cardiac cycles. And if you look carefully, hopefully, yeah, you should be able to see it. There are some subtle changes in the weighting of those different spatial frequencies. And it's those subtle changes in the, in the weighting of, you know, if we look at a particular spatial frequency where my pointer is here, it has some periodicity to it. Uh, and the sum of all of those changes, of all of those spatial frequencies, somewhat remarkably, gives me this underlying image, which is super useful. Physicians would really appreciate looking at this. <clears throat> Interestingly, there are some nice... Uh, properties between Fourier space and image space. So sometimes we do so-called image processing in Fourier space. Sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's more accurate. Uh, computers don't care, right? So sometimes it ends up being a sort of better uh, space to work in. Uh, okay, so this we saw before. I'll go through this really quickly. Different points in case space or different spatial frequency patterns. This is I don't know how much you guys like it. I like it. I think this is a great example of uh, patting myself on the back uh, of, of K space and image space. And so here you'll see this little fleet, right? This little thing that's zipping around through K space. And all I've done, you're going to do this in your homework, uh, uh, homework three that's out right now. Uh, you're basically going to do this exact same thing and you should get a very similar result. In um, you're going to take a point in K space. And you're going to grossly over exaggerate it, right? You're going to amplify its magnitude by some factor, big factor. And in doing so, that particular spatial frequency pattern will be heavily overrepresented in your underlying object. So this is the same case space data I showed you before. It's the same image data I showed you before, save for changes to a single spatial frequency. And so I think this is a good example. As this little case space point is moving around in case space, you'll, say, you'll see that the banding pattern changes its frequency and its orientation. Okay, so this is one way I think you can begin to understand what case space is all about. This is this is the best slide I can explain I can use to explain case space. The best single slide I can use to explain, uh, explain case space. Uh, we can pull out different components of case space, and what you'll learn or what you'll see is that the center of case space here is largely telling us about contrast information. So if I do a two D F T of just the middle parts of case space. I recover an, ob uh, an image of my object that still has some of the fundamental contrast, but it's not perfect, obviously. The resolution is pretty compromised, right? It's a blurry image, but fundamentally I have the, the basic contrast elements there. I can do the opposite. I can actually knock out the middle of K-space and just uh, 2D Fourier transform the edges of K-space. And then I recover this also interesting image, which is really just the edges of my object uh, uh, itself. And so this is just to point out that edges of K-space give us resolution and sort of uh, subtle features, if you will, edges. Uh, and the center of K-space largely dictates the overall contrast of the underlying image. Uh, we had some mathematical relationships that came out of uh, Kyung's lectures that told us more specifically how the spatial resolution delta x, the delta x of a pixel, for example, is related to the number of K-points in delta K. Uh, and so there's an inverse relationship between uh, our step size and our uh, delta x. What this means for us is that you need a lot of points of k-space. You need a lot of n's, right, to get a higher and higher resolution image. As n is going up my resolution, my delta x is getting smaller and smaller. And generally, we want small delta x's, but there are some trade-offs in terms of scan time and signal to noise that we'll talk about a little bit later. If you go out to uh, the edge of k-space, this should just be a little k, 
uh, n times delta k talks about how far out in the k space we're going to get. So did we get all the way to maybe the edge, which would be just the highest resolution that we wanted to acquire, or do we maybe not make it all the way out to the edge because we were trying to save time? Remember that each line requires a TR, and so I can acquire this image much more quickly, maybe half the time uh, than I could acquire this image. The downside being I didn't acquire as many spatial frequencies. I can't resolve uh, as sharply the underlying object. So it's a lower resolution image when you acquire fewer lines. Uh, we also saw that there was a relationship between the field of view and delta k. This is a, you know, again, one of these not very intuitive relationships in MR, but, a, but an important one to remember. When we get to the scanner, all we care about is field of view. We just punch in the field of view. The scanner calculates the required delta k to achieve that field of view. Uh, you'll see this in your homework as well. If, for example, you take out lines of k-space, uh, that is, you uniformly skip lines in k-space, that results in aliasing. Uh, so you should be able to sort of recapitulate a result like this in your homework assignment as well. Okay, a couple true falses. Uh, so k-space is the raw data collected by the scanner, true or false? Yeah, I mean, I said it that way, and then I corrected myself, right? For you guys, I don't know, right? There's this voltage signal first, and then we get to k-space. But when you work in MR as a scientist or whatever, we generally call k-space the raw data. Uh, a single echo fills all of k-space. You, you're just getting a line, right? It's all of k-space, and that's all you wanted, but that's not going to be very interesting for uh, anyone to look at. How about high-resolution imaging? Does it take longer because we need to acquire more of k-space? You have to get all the way out there, right? What happens if you what happens if you go all the way to the edges of k-space, high resolution, but you you didn't get all of the lines? You start skipping lines. What happens? You get you get aliasing, right? So you need all you need all the delta k's. You need every delta k, right? Uh, all the way out to your k max, so that you don't have aliasing and you achieve your target resolution. Okay, um, we've done it again. It's two forty three. Okay, uh, yeah, we'll come back. <laughs> it's only 20 more slides. Uh, we'll come back to these uh, next Wednesday. I'm not sure exactly how I'll make up the time, but I have some ideas. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and wrap. I can, oh, because I want to talk about the homework. That's right. So what I'm going to do is uh, wrap for today. We'll come back to these spatial localization slides. They're just trying to tie in together some of the uh, gradient and case-based concepts that we had today with pulse sequence diagrams, with Keong's lecture. So I'm trying to kind of link up some of the material for you guys. Uh, but it, it'll take too long to do it today. And I want to get you back to your homeworks. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand this back. Um, Write this down for yourselves because I want it's important for me that you guys know where you stand in the class because now's the time where you know uh, you guys certainly need to know. Uh, you should get the labs back. I was hoping to have them back today. They might be available in my office like Friday or something like that. I can send the scores out. Uh, we've got this Monday holiday. I know I can have them back by then, but you guys wouldn't have to get them. Uh, so if nothing else, you'll get them next Wednesday. Uh, bottom line, first homework assignment after the regrades, almost, I shouldn't say everyone, but several of you uh, turned in uh, makeup work for that. Uh, and as a consequence, the final average was 14.2 plus or minus 2.8. And that was arguably out of 15. There were some bonus points there as well. Uh, on the second assignment, people uniformly did uh, pretty well. Uh, there won't be a regrade option. I don't think we need one. Uh, the average was 13.7 plus or minus 1.9, and again, that's out of 15. You can look now, you have those two grades, you'll get your labs back soon. Without your lab score, the class average right now is basically 27.9 plus or minus 4.4. Um, if you're below something like 25, you might want to reach out to me. Uh, you might want to reach out to me or reach out to the TAs and make sure that you're on top of, you know, what's coming up for the rest of the class. We're, you know, I mean, week, what week is this? Is this week six, seven? I'll lose track a little bit. So we're kind of halfway through the class. You'll have roughly half of your assignments when you get the lab back. Uh, it's a good time to sort of check in. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say it one more time. Uh, I said it before. The folks that are going to visit the TA are uniformly nailing it. Uh, and if you're doing okay but not nailing it, my guess is you're also probably not going to the TA. And it's really helpful. Those guys are helpful. They won't give you the answers, but 
people are coming to office hours and saying, I, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm on the right track. I'm not really sure how to tackle this problem. Take advantage of that because that's uh, certainly your classmates are. Uh, so with that, I'll hand these back. Uh, Indra? And we'll get, we should be able to post the solutions for this right away. Like I said, I don't plan to do a regrade option. Sean? Yeah, Sean? Mike was um, principally responsible for this assignment, so your first, uh, if you have questions, there's always a normal, normal Ryan. Um, if you have questions about sort of just grading, how it was graded, or something that added up correctly, it happens from time to time. Uh, 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 talk to Mike first, or, uh, or send me an email. You win. Everybody? Hopefully, I didn't count them out, but I think everyone looks like they're busily looking at their assignments, right? Okay.